Stop 1, MR-143, Arrest Me Red. Each time I hoist myself up into the cab of Marguerite Robichaux's giant Arrest Me Red, her words, Dodge Ram truck, I know I'm in for some glorious slow going. Crawling might be too speedy a term for the way she, at times, navigates the back roads surrounding her home in the mountains of western Maine. In fact, it's not uncommon for her to take a half hour to get to the end of her own road, and it's only a mile long. That's because Marguerite Robichaux pays attention. A trip to the dump can turn into a morning-long safari of partridge and deer and fox sightings. The Sunday run to the Pines Market for the New York Times requires a mug of coffee and binoculars in hand, just in case the black-backed woodpeckers are in their nest. Or, if the light is falling just so on Black Nubble or Bigelow Mountain, you might have to brace yourself as she hits the brakes time and again to whip out her camera or sketchbook, or to just observe. Marguerite notices things. And when you travel with her, in person or through her paintings, you notice things too. Stop 2, MR-134, April in Maine, Mount Abram. I have had the good fortune to log hundreds, dare I say thousands of miles with Marguerite. We first met in 1996 when I was assigned to write about her open concept, modern home and studio in the north woods of Maine. I had only recently moved back to my home state and was establishing a career as a freelance writer. I was not familiar with Marguerite's work, and it had been years since I had strayed far off the Portland Peninsula, let alone into the deep woods, so you could say I was driving blindly into this friendship. But from the moment she met me at the door, and I saw the paintings lining her studio walls with that burnt sienna and umber, sap green and cerulean blue of her palette I would come to know so well, I sensed I had arrived someplace familiar. That she added, you drink martinis, don't you, to her warm southern welcome capped the deal. I knew I had found a fellow traveler indeed. Because of the nature of our careers, our work comes in spurts, breakneck races to deadlines and openings, followed by periods of recovery. It was these mutual lag times that allowed us to first, okay, let's be frank, goof off together, and later collaborate on outdoor adventure pieces for Down East Magazine. It also provided me with the rare and privileged opportunity to watch up close how an artist works and how shows like A Year in the Woods of Maine come into being. Stop 3, MR-132, Flagstaff Island. Marguerite's Kitchen is the staging area for many of our adventures, or mini-ventures, again her term, if time is limited. I usually come from Portland the night prior to, and will sit at her kitchen island or in front of the fire going over final details. We have our packing down to a science. Sometimes that just means icing down a couple cold beers and some of Marguerite's famous caviar pie for an afternoon cruise in her skiff to nearby Flagstaff Island. Or it can be as elaborate as cooking and packing for weeks in preparation for three nights of winter camping in a Northwoods yurt. Stemware, linens, and an insulated snowsuit were all musts. But wherever we go, we travel in style. The artist's preparation for fieldwork is just as meticulous. Marguerite has converted one of those picnic backpacks into a traveling painter's kit, storing brushes, pens, pencils, and tools where cutlery is intended to go. She stuffs the smaller pockets with paints and rags, the larger one with her camera. She slides in sketchbooks, panels, and paper where one would store dishes. It is arranged with the precision of a surgeon's bag. The drill of loading the truck is a familiar ritual. First in is the mountain of gear, whether it be snowshoes, fly rods, muck boots, spotting scopes, canoe paddles, sleeping bags, her French easel, whatever else we grab, followed by our personal effects. We do try to dress for dinner even if it means a long black skirt is coupled with a fleece vest and hiking boots. Last in are the multiple coolers to assure their easy access. The artist's backpack travels in the cab. At that point, we are ready to hit the road and let the noticing begin.
Stop 4, MR-128, November. Sometimes Marguerite and I are on assignment and have a specific destination, but most often it's just roam and ramble, break and gawk, detour and dead end, as though we didn't have a commitment in the world. And most of the time, we don't. What we are doing is harvesting impressions and ideas. It is a gift to have a painter for a friend, but especially for a writer. We speak the same language and know how to see. I might jot down a note or two. She may take a couple pictures. Marguerite is not fussy with a camera. She rarely even stops the truck. Would you at least like me to roll down the window, I'll ask? Nah, she'll say, as she holds up the camera with one hand and shoots. I have come to see these records as mere bookmarks, a subtle jog to the memory of an image that is already so familiar that it is burned inside her brain and, increasingly, in mine. Thus, I can say with the utmost certainty that I have gazed upon almost every sight and vista represented in this show, and I have done so with the artist. I cannot count the times I've studied that spindly elm of November out her kitchen window, waiting for the gray jays or evening grosbeaks to arrive. Yet, no matter how familiar these locales and subjects are, they are completely fresh to me in her paintings. Stop 5. MR 118. January. That's because Marguerite's work is not meant to be literal. Sure, you can almost feel the snowflakes smack your face if you stand close enough to January. But the artist is not depicting the landscape as it is, as much as reimagining it. Note the romanticism of December and how that lambent moonlight tumbling down onto Flagstaff Lake merits its own sonata. There is idealism in these images. A ridge might be a little more muscular and heroic, a snowfall a little heavier, a river with a greater bend, and there's drama, too. Can you not hear the creak of winter giving way to spring in April or the thunder of rushing water in Grand Falls? There's even the occasional touch of humor. Do not the intertwined trees in May just scream, Kiss me, you fool! But we understand it's all part of the artist's lens through which we're looking. And, in case we forget these are works of the imagination, Marguerite employs various signature techniques, drips, unfinished edges, visible brush marks and graphite lines that allow us to see the choices and decisions she's made and sometimes reversed along the way in each piece. She makes sure we see the hand of the artist at work, reminding us that we are not looking at nature. We are looking at a painting. Stop 6. MR 120. March. What makes a year in the woods of Maine so remarkable as a collection is what's going on behind the images we see, and that is the work of a mature artist in complete control of her craft. There is a sense of pentimento here, not in terms of paint. Marguerite's touch is light. Her oils are thinned with turpentine. I can even smell it on my clothes when I get home after a long visit. This creates an almost translucent feel to the pigment. The paint is applied with a loose, sweeping stroke that creates a watercolor-like wash and flow. She says she wipes away as much paint as she applies, and one of her favorite tools to pick up spots of paint is the lowly, common Q-tip, which she buys by the growth. Her studio floor is littered with them and their multicolored cottony tip. She also often uses the white background of gessoed linen in lieu of opaque white paint, as she does in March. Look at those spruce trees. You can almost feel the weight on their branches, the sag of their shoulders. This is clearly the work of someone who knows the strain of hefting a snow shovel. Yet, this weight is not what is added to the surface, but left from it. No one paints snow like you do, I'll say. I don't paint snow, she'll respond dryly. I paint around it. Stop 7, MR 127, October. When I speak about the sense of pentimento in Marguerite's work, 
What I mean is the buildup of intimate knowledge of her subject matter that underlies each painting. You can almost feel the presence of the preceding season shimmering beneath the surface of these landscapes. It's almost as though if you scraped away a corner of October's fiery hues, please don't, you'd find a lush green meadow beneath. With February, you might be looking at a winter scene, but you can feel the artist knows every rock and bend in that stream and every hoof and paw that trod its banks before the snow. With August, she knows what the light was like when Bigelow was ablaze with autumn and how it will look shrouded with fog or the season's first frost. Marguerite Robichaux knows the land. But this knowledge goes beyond mere proximity. The romance and idealism are tempered with a fierce passion, a fury even, as so many of the wild places in Maine vanish. Preservation is part of her artist's manifesto. Documenting these places before they're gone is part of her mission. That's because Marguerite Robichaux is no objective observer. She, in the most literal sense of the word, empathizes with or enters into the world she sees around her. The land is as much part of her as it is her work. Stop 8, MR 129, December. That's why it's so exciting to view this collection as a whole. While each painting encompasses its own realm, threads of color weave these works together like a symphonic light motif. Start in January and see how those somber greens and blues of the winter months bleed into spring, giving way to a paler blue and a softer green in May. We also pick up touches of pink in the sky along the way, and those pinks thread through the lupin in June and are reflected in the dappled water of July, carrying us to the first hints of autumn's orange in August. From there, the yellow gold of fall enters, wending toward the end of the year. Thus, as the days darken, so does the palette. The pale blues deepen, the greens grow inky, and by December, we have returned to those somber colors from the start of the year. With each painting, we are not merely looking at one moment suspended in time, but an interwoven world unified by the vision and passion of the artist. A Year in the Woods of Maine invites you to leave the clock behind and trust the tick of nature. If you do so, these evocative landscapes will transport you. The going is slow, but as I can attest, the rewards are ample. As I work in clay, the reality that is the starting point is the choice to investigate the formal range of the vessel structure in clay. And the belief in the potential that the pieces must entertain, suggest a narrative, and allude to things outside of themselves. The largest question is how to invest my art with life, force, and dignity with a sensibility to the process and material. I am interested in this process as a means to manifest ideas and form. Categories are not important. The ongoing pursuit to enlarge the boundaries of conventional perceptions in the media is essential. Stop 1, RJ28. Large triangulated platter, flashing slip with trailing decoration. This powerful and elegant large platter portrays the three basic elements of geometry. The square is represented by a firing shadow cast by a square sushi plate that's placed above the platter, supported by shells during the firing process. The triangle is represented using the additive process of applying soft clay on the front of the platter and the subtractive process of removing clay to make a non-traditional foot with very strong sculptural elements. The circle is in the initial making process on a foot-driven traditional Mashiko potter's wheel. The black and white trailing is drawn with a ladle with a very viscous slip. Stop to RJ-134, round teapot flashing slip. 
Japanese cast iron hot water kettles referred to as tetsubin were the genesis for these hand-constructed teapots. Teapots and the many associated parts, such as handles, spouts, and lids, give the artist an opportunity to engage in a creative playfulness, constantly challenging their creative notions as they engage with the design, elements of function, scale, and surface. This piece has a rich surface and strong posture and sense of historical reference. Stop 3, RJ110, base with two chimneys and bird. The idea of using two vertical elements connected on a low crowned base comes from a reference and influence from African mass forms. This would be the ears and the forehead of the mass. The negative space between the two columns becomes as important to the piece as the structures themselves. The bird is symbolic as a messenger historically representing the pathway between Earth and a higher power. The first place of historical reference is on a staff that is beside a fallen hunter in an ancient cave painting in the cave of Lascaux, France. The piece with the double chimneys and bird is a piece that has strong sculptural intentions. Stop 4, RJ131, stacking box with rope inlay. Variations of this striking piece are represented in a number of important museum collections, which include the Minneapolis Art Institute, the Nelson Museum in Kansas City, and the LA County Museum in Los Angeles. It is structurally a very difficult piece to construct out of a ceramic material. Traditionally, stacking boxes, called jubaku, were made from lacquer and ceramic and were typically used in a ceremonial context. Stop 5, RJ113, boat form with rope inlay. This piece began with the childhood memories of working on inverted wooden boat hulls. The expansive curve and extension of this form and space create a very dynamic energy. The texture is done by impressing the pattern from a piece of silk obi cord onto the leather hard clay form. Ash during the firing process is received into the interior of the piece to blend into the flashing slip at high temperatures. Stop 6, RJ115, sushi platter with anagama natural ash with trailing decoration. This is a deceivingly simple form, yet one of the most difficult to have succeed with a powerful presence. It is formed with a soft curve and has no formal foot structure. The presentation of sushi or any elegantly prepared food will serve both the piece and food presentation well. Displayed on a stand, it will present itself as a significant piece in almost any environment. Stop 7, RJ124, Bachelor Series Vase with Red Flashing Slip. The nine Malik figures created in lead foil in Marcel Duchamp's sculpture, A Bride Strip bear by her bachelors, was the primary inspiration to engage in this series of pattern-constructed vases by the artist. This figurative vase form reflects a continued theme from an early interest by the artist in patterns and the geometry of the constructivist era of art in the early 20th century. Stop. 8. RJ20. Squared base, chino glaze, iron decoration. In the far reaches of the ancient cave of Font de Gomme in Les Aisies, France, there's a set of 25 handprints outlined by red iron oxide. It was this historical experience 
that led the artist to leave fingerprints embedded in the glaze structure to become both a visual and tactile connection with the users of this piece now and in the future. The Chino glaze is very textural, and the whole experience of the vase is visceral. Stop 9. RJ24, you know me, with overglaze red and green. This simple piece is meant to be held and to serve daily tea or a good bourbon. Yunomis have the potential, possibly more than any other ceramic piece, to connect directly the artist and the user. Many will enjoy using these simple vessels for a solitary refreshment or use the opportunity to serve and share moments of conversation with friends. The maker can impart gesture and communicate common felt qualities of movement and attitude. The overglazed red and green enamel recipes and materials were given to the artist directly by Shoji Hamada during the artist's stay there in 1975.